tell you what I still want to <coughs> talk to you about. Today, I want to talk to you about the complication, about what happens to the standard model if you have a more complicated Higgs sector. Mm -hmm. So you have seen the Higgs sector that I introduced was the sigma model. <coughs> and if you use the sigma model to generate masses for the vector bosons, that is a simple case that you can have. Yeah. And what happens when you take another case? And then we will learn certain things. And then that, that I want to go to that today in detail. Then tomorrow I will do the other thing. After all, we do not know for sure if the Higgs is not if the Higgs is there or not. And the way it works is this: we now want to take the make the uh, maybe the Higgs is not there. How can I study that situation? The one way of studying that situation is to take the standard model with the Higgs as in the sigma model, and the mass there is free, it's a free parameter, we don't know what it is, it can be anything. And we take that mass and make it become very heavy. And we make the physical assumption that if the mass goes to infinity, that is like studying that there is no Higgs. So that's the idea. The idea is therefore. <coughs> that's called the heavy Higgs hypothesis. The idea of the heavy Higgs hypothesis is that what we see there is what you would see if there were no Higgs. That's the same like removing the Higgs. In actual fact, that's not as simple as that, but that's the first step onto the way of understanding what's going on. The next step, if we make the Higgs heavy, we will discover that the interactions of the vector bosons only the longitudinal polarizations, certain, com certain polarization of the vector bosons, interacting with each other will become a strong interaction. So we will discover if we try to remove the Higgs, we get strong interactions between the vector bosons. Now, up to now, we have not really been able to study that because the best machine, the lab machine that we have, has an energy which is maximum like, what is it, 190, 200 GeV, and the vector bosons are like 80 GeV, so to make a pair of them, you need at least 160 GeV, but then you have so little phase basis. People have not been able to study properly what a pair of vector bosons does, because the energy of the lab machine was not big enough. <coughs> so with the LHC, this is no longer the case, we have lots of energy, and we might come to study the behavior of vector boson pairs if indeed they start displaying a strong interaction. Now that system is a complicated system and the way to study it is by a parallel which sometimes may be true or may not be true but it's sort of the only thing you can do is by studying the parallel between that system and the sigma model. The sigma model I told you is also the model by which people describe pion physics at low energy. And we know a lot about that from experiment, from theory. And we may assume that that pion physics, which is based on the sigma model, would be roughly, give, would give us an idea of what happens to the vector bosons when the Higgs becomes heavy. So the Higgs becomes heavy, we get strongly interacting system of the sigma model, a strongly interacting system of the sigma model is also what you have with pions, although at much lower energy, because the pions have a mass of, what is it, 139 MeV, and the vector bosons have a mass of 60 GeV. So it's a matter of scale. So what we will try to do then is take the, what we know from the sigma model and pion physics at low energy and scale it to the high energy of the standard model. That means scaling from 139 MeV to 60 GeV. That's quite a jump, but that's the idea. Yeah, actually, we will not scale the masses, but in much more appropriately <coughs> divide the expectation value, but we will, we will come to that. So that's the program that I have in mind. And then we will see that there are various cases that you can distinguish, that it is possible that the vector bosons, in the case there is no Higgs or a heavy Higgs, 
they will start displaying behavior much like pion scattering. Then you may get all the features <coughs> of strong interactions. Those pions may start attract each other and make a resonance to bound state. That could be. We will study the, the possibility that this happens and see if it, that is likely. We will discover that it is extremely unlikely. Yeah? And that will be sort of the end of the lecture, that, so that you see that that's an unknown domain, and we will have to wait what the experiment does. But if the Higgs is truly heavy, we have a problem. It will not be easy to find out what precisely happen, happens. There is one case where you can definitely say that something like that happens, and I will try to indicate that to you. It's a sort of a very complicated situation, and I'm not sure if I will ever be able to do it. <coughs> So that's the program that we have for these two types. So first, I want to talk to you in a superficial manner. I will not go in detailed explanation, in detailed calculations. You can do them. You can get these talks. I'm sure that uh, Maria Jose, Jose or Jose, 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 can give you a copy of it. It's a PDF file which you can read on every uh, on every computer. I have a design. You have already done it. Okay. So, and then, you, because if there is a calculation to be done, you can find the details in there. And if you don't find the details in there, in there you can also look to the CERN yellow report of 1996, where, when I gave much more extended lectures at CERN. And that's a yellow report, and I, you'll find it out. It's lectures on the Higgs system, something like that, by me in 1996, and you will find a little bit more details. It's <coughs> amazing how complicated this can be. So I described with you the Sigma model. This is the model that we use, that we, uh, the easiest, the simplest model that you can use to give vector passes to the vector bosons. You know that the vector bosons are weak interactions, W plus, W minus, and Z zero, they have a mass. So they have, the mass has to be obtained using a system, and the reason you have to do that is because then the theory remains finite and renormalizable. I won't go into that either. But this is the idea. We generate the mass by this system in order to get a nice finite theory. And so the sigma model is, however, despite it is the simplest case, it is a model which is very rich. It first of all has this, there you see it, it's a four component field, four fields. You need to have four fields. You need to have more than three fields. In fact, you need to have four fields or more because you must give mass to three vector bosons, which means you have to introduce at least three new degrees of freedom, which must come from this Higgs business. And then, of course, there must be some physics remaining from the Higgs as well. So you cannot have less than four components. So the four component Higgs field, this here, is the, the least you can have to make a realistic model of the weak and electromagnetic interactions. With this model, you can give mass to three vector bosons and not four, so one will remain massless, which is the photon, which is just fine, because it is massless. So we have an O4 symmetry. It is a six parameter symmetry, and you can rewrite it in different ways, and then you learn something by rewriting it. So I'm going to do that right now. I did. I, the most important one is. Uh, this is the one that we use for the standard model. You, call, you introduce <coughs> something called K, and this K thing is a spinner, which has, as you can see, four degrees of freedom because it's a complex spinner, and you can write down that Lagrangian, and you can use that K field to make mass to the vector bosons. It's totally the identical Lagrangian, just written in a different way, but I see different symmetries here. What you see in this here very well is the symmetry SU2 plus U1. Because the K, if you make that transformation, yeah, K going to a unitary transformation times K, that is a matrix, 
as you see it, the matrix U contains three parameters lambda and the three matrix as tau. And this gives a transformation of the K and the Lagrangian is invariant for this transformation. And so the Lagrangian is invariant for S U2. On top of it, this transformation that you get K is K factor, phase factor. That means that K is also invariant for this uh, symmetry with one degree of freedom, U1. There it is. And so you have an SU2 plus U1 symmetry, which is what you need for a standard model. So people doing the standard model will usually, at least in the beginning, this notation was used. However, I will advocate another symmetry because we realize that this symmetry, there is something hidden. This is a four parameter symmetry, three for SU2 and one for U1 here. But the original symmetry is six parameters. So there is some sort of a hidden symmetry. You don't see it clearly. And so there might be symmetries and things in the theory that you cannot see because of this notation. And indeed, such is the case. And the hidden symmetry that you have in this case it leads to a mass relation between the vector bosons, which I will discuss in some more detail shortly. But for my discussions of this Higgs system, I think by far the best is to use the sigma model written with an explicit SU2 plus SU2 symmetry. The sigma model has six parameters, and SU2 symmetry has three parameters, so SU2 cross SU2 means you have six parameters. So then you have sort of the full symmetry content of the theory. And to see this, the thing that you have to do is introduce a matrix. So you introduce a matrix phi, which again contains the phi 4 phi sigma, you remember it was phi 4, it's the same thing. So we have this phi. This is a matrix, and you define the Lagrangian in this way. The trace of the product of phi cross and phi. So the only thing that it depends on is the trace of phi cross times phi. The two by two matrix times the two by two matrix, you take the trace. So this, this I tell you, this Lagrangian that you can verify is still totally the same, it's identically the same as the one that she started from. Yeah. Except that in this way of writing, we see different properties than in the other way of writing. In the other way of writing, we saw the O4 symmetry. Rotations in four dimensions, real rotations in four dimensions. Here we see something else. What you see here is two SU2 symmetries. You can multiply phi on the left-hand side with the exponential of a matrix, a two by two matrix, which is an SU2 matrix. An SU2 matrix is a unitary matrix in two dimensions. Unitary meaning, meaning U cross U equals one. Yeah. So this is such a matrix. It's just one way of writing it, involving three parameters. And you can multiply phi on the left with it, and you can also multiply phi on the right with it. And in most cases, it's a Lagrangian here stays the same. As you do left, is this. And as you do right, is this. And of course, for phi cross, it takes this form. And you can see, since we take the trace of the product of phi cross and phi, phi times phi cross, you see here I have phi with this matrix in front. And this is that same matrix, but with a minus sign, so that's the inverse matrix. So phi cross phi is evidently a variant. Okay. And similarly, so phi plus phi is invariant for these transformations. Therefore, this Lagrangian has as a manifest symmetry, that's the way you put it, you can see it with the naked eye, the manifest symmetry is two times an SU2 symmetry. SU2 plus SU2. So you learn an important rule, not the mathematic mathematicians tell you. The symmetry we had before, which O4, the six parameter symmetry, is can also be rewritten. It contains also two times an SU2 symmetry. There is an additional symmetry called Z2 that I don't want to talk about for because I don't know exactly what it is. I just know it's there. And that is because you can give one a minus sign with respect to the other, the SU2. And that's another symmetry that is uh, somewhat 
that you don't want to consider. So we divide it out. So we know that the discrete group set two, elements one and minus one is not, not of interest to us here. We don't want to talk about it. But strictly from a mathematician's point of view, that's what we have to write. Okay. I claim, to my opinion, this way of writing the sigma model with the SU2 cross SU2 symmetry is the best running connection with the standard model. You stand best, understand best what is going on. So that's why I want to introduce the symmetry and I will discuss the standard model by using this. And the reason that I will do it this way because one of the things that we will learn is that there is something like isospin symmetry. And isospin is a symmetry whereby W plus, W minus, W zero, Z zero, and W minus are three equivalent that you have an invariance for rotations among these three. That's isospin. So isospin is a very simple symmetry, and it is directly applicable to the standard model, and it's nice to know how that symmetry is and what it does. Yeah. So for this reason, you want these, you want it in this way. Okay, so that's uh, what we will now do next. A comes the standard model. This piece I will skip. This is the part of uh, involving the vector bosons. I will not talk to you about it. I only want to notice that the standard model uses only three vector bosons, V1, V2, V3, which you can write as W plus W minus and Z0. <coughs> so there's only three vector bosons and one photon. And the symmetry is SU2 cross U1. SU2 symmetry and U1 for the symmetry. Now we do have here, the sigma model has a bigger invariance. It's SU2 cross SU2, <coughs> two times SU2. In the standard model you have less than you can generate here. You have three vector bosons and a photon, it is SU2 cross U1. That means from one of the two SU2s you have here, you need only one piece, a U1, a one parameter piece. So that's what you'll do. Am I clear if there's any problems? And please tell me if you would like to try help mother, consider me your mother, then I'll try to help. You understand? Do you understand everything? Are you lying to me? Yes. Tell me you're lying to me. <laughs> Okay, now we have to also understand a little bit what happens. How do we use the sigma model to generate a mass to the vector bosons? Well, it's extremely simple. You write, here is the, here's that sigma model. There, this is uh, d mu phi. And then you, you, you use that Lagrangian, etc., etc. Uh, I, I really don't want to go into that calculation, but basically, you shift phi, you remember that we did that in the first lecture. We shifted the scalar field by a constant. And that generated the mass. It goes here the same way. You shift phi to phi plus F0. F0 is determined by getting to the minimum of some potential. Yeah. And so this is the shift that you want to make. Where what the shift here is, that involves the unit matrix. <coughs> And this shift generates the vector bosons masses. And here it is computed what masses you generate. And so in the end you find there's also the mixing, the mixing problem, that's a bit of a problem that I don't want to touch from at this stage. Mm -hmm. So now I want to go straight away without going into details how that and what masses that it generates, it generates the right masses. It generates also this relationship, the row parameter. So all that is fine. Now we want to see if there is some more in the whole business. Yeah. The question is namely that there is in this theory something which is almost like isospin. So I have to tell you what isospin is, what symmetry is this. To consider again the Higgs vector, the sigma model. If I have SU2 left, that was the transformation on the left hand side. And SU2 right was the transformation on the right hand side. Okay. Now you can you also can make a symmetry 
<coughs> I interpret these two. That is to say, you will take the lambda L and the lambda R the same. Can you do that? Of course you can do that. Yeah. That means you have then a three-parameter symmetry, which is sort of these two at the same time. Mathematicians call this as you do left plus as you do right. If you let the two go in cadence, you understand? Similarly. So that's what we do here. We take phi and we choose lambda right and lambda L to be the same. Yeah? And also, and, and the beauty of this is that if you put here this unit matrix in between, then these transformations do nothing, you see. So th this transformation, as you to left plus as you to right, leaves the shift invariant. That's the peculiar thing of it. So this symmetry, which is a global symmetry, we have not yet talked about vector bosons. And so this, this symmetry is, is in fact ordinary isospin. Yeah, it's an SU2 type symmetry. It is a three parameter symmetry, and it is exactly like isospin in strong interactions. You know, you may not know that, but it doesn't really matter at this point. But it is ordinary isospin. Who will investigate what, what symmetry this is? The symmetry <coughs> is broken. You understand? We have here SU2 plus SU right, we have a transformation to the left and one to the right. But in the standard model, we had only SU2 left, and SU2. we didn't have an SU2 right, we only had U1. Yeah. And the U1 symmetry is only one component of these three. So that's not part of the symmetry. In this symmetry, lambda 1, 2, 3 for both sides are taken the same. Yeah. In the standard model, 1, 2, 3, that's okay, but then on the right hand side, I have something independent with only lambda 3, possibly non zero. That's our U1 piece. So we don't have that symmetry. Therefore, important conclusion electromagnetism breaks the symmetry. As soon as we introduce U1, which will lead to electromagnetism there, next to the three vector bosons, then you break the symmetry. And so electromagnetism, like it does in other cases too, breaks the isospin symmetry. And once we know that, there is a number of things that we can say. First of all, that's then I explain, I will go into that once more. If you have isospin symmetry, then the masses of the three vector bosons must be identical. And plus and minus and z0 should have the same mass. Because this isospin symmetry transforms these vector bosons into each other. Yeah. Which I have not shown explicitly, but we just have to assume it here. So this isospin symmetry transforms the three vector bosons <coughs> into each other. And if the theory is invariant for the transformation, it means they must have the same mass. So this, this isospin symmetry leads to the result leads to the result that the mass of the charge vector bosons which is m square and the mass of the neutral vector boson is at zero must be the same apart from sine theta w what is sine theta w sine theta w gives you the strength of the u1 piece so it gives you the strength of the symmetry breaking of su2 cross su2 because we have only SU2 cross U1. So this breaks the symmetry and therefore due to that the masses need not to be the same. This is also for pions. The pions, if I just been there correct, the charged pion and the neutral pion would have the same mass. Now the charged pion has 139.5 MeV and the neutral one has 136. So it's clearly not correct, but it comes of electromagnetism that makes, gives the charge and the neutral pion different cell energy and therefore splits the mass apart. So electromagnetic interactions also in normal pion physics do destroy the isospin symmetry and leads to a difference in masses between pi plus, pi zero, pi minus. 
Uh, so far, it's seeming the same as what we are dealing with here. Now comes the difficulty. So m square and m zero square are the same, yeah, apart from corrections of our sine theta. Now, then you actually compute it, you find this is the relationship, and that was what I talked about the other time. If you try to understand the fact that this thing is round, from isospin type considerations, you cannot. You can it only as far that you don't know how to deal with cos square theta. I'm not aware of a good calculation that shows you that this here, the order of sine theta w, is something that is, works out in precisely this form. So it's true that electromagnetism for which co cosine square theta is a measure, the way it differs from that. Mm -hmm. We have here the breaking of isospin, m squared and zero square are not equal in this theory, and experimentally they are not equal. The breaking of that is proportional to sine square theta. You can write cos square theta as one minus sine square theta. So the breaking goes to sine square theta. But to compute it exactly, you have just to do the computation, and you cannot do it on symmetry considerations alone. But therefore, you can understand this parameter, this row parameter, which is equal to 1. Try to understand it as a consequence of some sort of isospin symmetry of the standard model. And that is what you wanted to say the other time, right? So there you see that if you just have a little bit of patience. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's an important statement, and the, the, the fact that it occurs in the form of 1 over cosine square theta, that is a peculiar accident, also the most important accident, because it allows the comparison with experiments that we can learn a lot from. What happens if I take another Higgs system, which doesn't have so simply the SU2 cross SU2? Well, we will probably lose isospin, the isospin invariance. And then this will not be true anymore, this relationship. So if we go to more complicated Higgs system, we will probably lose this, this relationship, which is in these case. Sometimes you can still make statements on this ratio here, m squared over m zero squared, but they are not uh, very meaningful. <coughs> now, here I give you something without going through the calculation. You can find it if you wish, but it is a bit of a nasty calculation. This row parameter, I told you, it is 1, plus radiative corrections. Radiative corrections are things that you get because a particle momentarily split up into two other particles. That's the quantum mechanical effect. It's a loop effect. You have to do quantum field theory to compute them, so it's sort of complicated and much more complicated than the level of the lecture so far. So I just quote the result. If I compute what happens to a charge vector boson, see, the way it works like this. A charge vector boson has a certain mass, a neutral vector boson has a certain mass, and the ratio of these two with the cos square theta equals 1. Now something happens to, due to quantum mechanics, something happens to the charge W, because it may, mo may momentarily split up into, let's say, another W plus Z0 or, or a Higgs part. If I have a charge vector boson, it can momentarily split up into a charge vector boson and the Higgs part, the additional Higgs part. That's too much from the point of view of energy, but a quantum mechanic, you can have that for a limited time. So you can have, here goes the boson, and whoop, whoop. And at least there are short moments that its mass changes. So something happens to the mass of that particle. This you can compute because we know quantum field theory and we can compute those things. And what you see here is an important formula that makes the calculation of such effects. And there are two types of effects which have proven to be unbelievably important in the last few years because there is something very special here. What can happen with a vector boson? A vector boson at W plus can split up, for example, into a positron and a neutrino, because that's a weak interaction. That's a normal weak interaction. Like a beta decay, the neutron becomes a proton and a W, 
en de W splitst op in het elektron en een neutrino. Zo de W koppels door elektron en neutrino, of de positron en anti-neutrino, etc. Zo een vectorboson may split up, among others, into a top quark and a bottom quark. There is also such a coupling in the standard model. And so momentarily, a W, a vector boson, may become a bottom quark and a top quark. Now you say so what, yeah? The point is that this symmetry here somehow makes it possible that you see this correction. There is a very unique situation. And the unique situation is that we are dealing with a gate theory. And in a gate theory, all kinds of symmetry must be strictly true. And if the symmetry is not strictly true, if the gate symmetry is broken, you get infinities. So if you start chasing the symmetry a little bit, it may result in there being infinities. So in a gate theory like we have today for the weak interactions, it is important that you realize that small changes may have big consequences. And what's even more important, the top quark at the time that this equation was written down for the first time, no one knew where the top quark was. What mass it had. Yeah. We thought it would be there, but we didn't know its mass. It was compared to the bottom quark. The ice is still compared to the bottom quark and top quark. And then the top quark. We didn't know its mass. But because the effect of the top quark being there, if it was not there or if it was too heavy, it would break the symmetry of the theory and bring up an infinity. And this had as a consequence that if the top quark was not there, if it was very heavy, it would be a disaster. And therefore we got something very unique in quantum theory. We had a radiative correction involving a particle, and if the particle was heavy, the radiative correction became big. And therefore the radiative correction did something for us which up to now never happened. It told us it gave us a window on what that could be. You understand? If you, something of which you don't know if it, if it exists or not, but you know if it's not there, if it is too heavy, it makes a disaster. You see the disaster is not happening, therefore you can say it should not be heavier than such and so. And, and I make it myself clear. This is due to the fact that the gate theory is renormalizable, is finite, only if the symmetry holds. If you break the symmetry, well, you be careful. Big changes may happen. So it's a very peculiar feature of a gate theory that if you have this top mass, if the top is too heavy, it is needed there for the symmetry of the theory. The top and the bottom must form as you do do that. You break that symmetry, you will get infinities. Therefore, that translates in the end to the statement that you get an effect proportional to the top part mass. And if you want to take, if you want to remove the top from the theory by making its mass infinite, you will get an infinite correction. This never happened before. There are no attempts before. No, because we, we, had, never, we, 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 were, we were never dealing with the gate theory. And in the context of the standard model, in the process of discovering the charm and the other experiments, there were no examples for this. This was the first. Well, it, you know, it became only the reason was this one because you knew the other masses. This one, we didn't know the masses. But it was that one time. I mean, it did happen in the history. That, uh, well, they could have been too, but they were discovered before the lady did actually computer. It was no point. But to give you another example, if you look to the radiative corrections, like to the magnetic moment of the electron, or to the lens shift, these are two famous radiative corrections, the importance of which was established in 1948. That's how quantum electrodynamics became a big series. In the case of the magnetic moment of the electron, the electron has a magnetic moment which is, has a value, and that value of that magnetic moment was also affected by radiative corrections. 
Well, it was easy to establish that those radiative breaks, for example, an electron could momentarily split into a photon and an electron. And you see it, here goes the electron, momentarily it splits in a photon and an electron. Then the photon could momentarily split into a pi plus and a pi minus. They could all recombine again. And so the combination pi plus, pi minus could, in this way, contribute to a change of the magnetic moment, which they were measuring. But you could quickly see in that theory that particles which were heavier than, let's say, 50 MeV, they made no contribution, or a very small one. And it became less as the particle became heavier. So the radiative corrections known to mankind till there came symmetries in the theory were always such that the radiative correction would go to zero if the particles involved in that correction were sufficiently heavy. So the radiative corrections to the electromagnetic moment was never, <coughs> it was never possible to deduce from that that there would have to be a particle of this uh, such and so mass to produce this. So the radiative corrections of uh, to, to the electromagnetic moment was never a window is which you could look to possibly other heavy particles. Yes? Yeah, this is very peculiar. Is there any other observable in which the radiative corrections go with a positive power? Yeah, that they, they didn't exist. Is there any other apart from this one? There is <coughs> no. No. It's just this one. This because it's the only symmetry that we have left at this point. Uh, at least I don't know of any other one. This is a very unique one. Can you tell from here that there is no fourth generation? Yes, not really, no. But let me go into that for a second. That of course the interesting question. First of all, let's apply this to the case that there had to be. There was a bottom quark, therefore we know, we know for the symmetry of the series that there had to be a top quark. Then you computed what it did to this row parameter, this is what you found. This is the state that comes out. So you discover that there's a relative correction to the row parameter which grows as the top mass is bigger. This is uh, very peculiar and totally new in the question of radiative corrections. And since people were capable of measuring rho, which you can measure by measuring the mass of the charge, that is the neutral vector motion. So you can compute rho. You can measure it experimentally. Uh, Mr. Marero has probably done it at some time or other. And so from that measurement, you subtract one, and then you get a measure. You can get an idea of the top mass, provided you can say something about this term, which I'll discuss in a minute. But the fact that this term will generally be a lot smaller than this one. So in the first approximation, you ignore this term, which is the influence of the Higgs mass onto the rho parameter. What you have is the difference between the top and the bottom mass. Because it's the symmetry that you break, the azure spin symmetry. But you see, at the time that this became relevant, the bottom mass was known. And so you didn't worry, it was very much smaller than the top mass. So it didn't play any role. It was a good approximation to take it zero. But normally, what appears here is due to the symmetry breaking, the SU2 symmetry breaking. So the mass difference between the top and the bottom. Now if there is a fourth generation, all that this equation will tell you is that the difference in mass between the low and the higher, just as he says, has to be limited because of what you have seen here. But that can be. You can have a fourth generation, but you can make a statement that the masses must be approximately the same. Okay? Is that true? 
well, for this you must do a still harder calculation and compute the total radiative correction to the, to the mass of the vector motion under Z0. And then you discover that if you have another Dublet, yeah, which I usually call the high, the high quark and the low quark, so first top and bottom and then high and low quark, yeah, you get from the big mass. The point is they still make a contribution that you can observe in the, in the, in the, in the dumping masses. And you can make some sort of a limit. So that's another observable that has hmm? a positive power on the masses. Well, it doesn't go with the square of the masses, but it's sort of more complicated. And I don't know by head what it was exactly. But you can make some statement. <coughs> you have to be a little bit careful if you use those things. But you see, what happens is that that's, that's the important part that you have to see. You have three generations of quarks up and down quark, and charm and, uh, and stage quark, and then top and bottom quark, and you see a pattern. You see top and bottom, the up and down quark differ in mass, a little bit, and they are small, then charm and stage, they are higher, and they differ by an amount which is bigger. Then you have the next generation, much heavier, and the mass differs are even heavier. If this is a pattern which has anything to do with nature, you would expect if there is a fourth generation, it would be even worse. That now is excluded. Yeah. So if you want to believe this woozy theory, this woozy rhythm reasoning, then you would say there is no fourth generation. And in any case, if you assume that there are yet other quarks that we have not discovered, there are pretty strict limits that we have on them already. It's sort of uneasy to work this. So I, if you ask me, then I would say that uh, it's probably true that there are no more than three generations. And this now is strange. This is very strange. So that tells you how important this is. <coughs> Why is it strange that there would be only three generations? Well, you discover that if you start thinking, and when is the last time you started singing? <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm making these nasty jokes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so let's start singing for a minute. Suppose you have here the standard model. Yeah? You have seen it. Three generations. One, two, three. Yes? I always have a picture for that. But is it on this computer? I don't know. I don't dare to touch it. <coughs> but you have the up and down quark and the electron and the neutrino. And then you have the charm and the stage quark and the muon and its neutrino. And now we have the top and the bottom quark <coughs> and the tall particle and its neutrino. So we have three generations. I think that most of you have met this sometime, somewhere, in some action. Yeah, this is the standard model with three generations. What I would like to do, of course, is understand these three generations. So I remember very well, it was around 1976 or so, when I discovered this, this thing here. And I was at that time doing what I could to try to establish. At that time, the bottom quark was found. 76 or 77, do you remember when? Later on, the speed of 76. 78. The bottom quark was found. <coughs> And therefore, you know for sure there had to be a third generation. There had to be a top quark, of which we didn't know the mass. So at that time, the situation arose, and if you are a serious person, you started thinking, hey, there's a third generation. Now, we all can count to three. But you all know one and two, we can understand. But if you say one, two, three, we automatically say four, five, six. So at that time, it was very natural to think, there probably is a whole series. Yet another, yet another, yet another. Is there an end to it? Is, are there only three? Are there 500? That became the interesting question. So I remember sort of starting to think day and night about whether there would be an, an unending series of generation, or just three or four, if it was finite. Then I had to rub to stop on this equation. And then it became clear to me that there were was a limited number of generations, see, maybe four. Yeah. So what, do you, what does it mean? 
Well, whenever you see such a recurrence of things that was seen before, you may remember there was Mr. Mendeleev. Do you remember Mr. Mendeleev? It's amazing because he was dead long before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> Mendeleev was the man of the periodic, the man of the periodic system. Remember? So he found this periodicity, this this. A little bit like we have here, one generation, two, three generations, so this totally, completely recurring situation. This was later explained, of course, we now know that the recurrence of Mr. Mandeliev is due to the building up of atoms by means of protons and neutrons. The hydrogen atom is one proton, you add a proton, you get helium, etc., etc., you, you add neutrons as you see fit. So the Mendeleev system we came to understand by starting from just two particles, the proton and the neutron. So seeing here these generations, you got the idea that maybe we have a similar situation. We are talking here maybe about somehow a system that generates bound states that occur like that. But here is the problem. If you start making bound states, there's no end to it. Mendeleev, the periodic system, has no end to it. Of course, when you go over 92, the elements become unstable. But by itself, there is no end to it. You can always add one more or so. So if you start making bound states, which I remember trying at the time, whatever you do in the end, you wind up with not only one, two, three, but four, five, six generations. So the statement that there is a limit to the number of generations arising from this boils down to the statement that you think, as most likely, that there be only three generations, and that they are therefore not bound states. And this, in a sense, is bad news. You will not be able to simplify in any easy method the question of three generations. Isn't that nice thinking? You don't have to compute anything, all you do is think. <laughs> So we conclude that the generation, the quarks, they are probably not bound states. Why then do we have three generations? It is the great big mystery of our time. And I think no one has the answer. Yes? I thought Kobayashi was Kawa already had uh, they had already three, three generations, three generations before the beam. But they did not exclude four, five, six, seven, two hundred. What Kobayashi and Maskawa did, they took the theory of two, there's two generations, and they demonstrated that just two generations you could have could not have CP variation. Yeah. So therefore they said there must be three generations. This is true, and that was very good. Right, come in. No. That, no. that was our Bell and Hems. Bell and Vell and what do you say? Okay, welcome. Thank you. Almost through. <laughs> Happy man, <Maya. laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I wish you to understand that of that Kobayashi Maskara, I respected greatly what they did. At the time that they did it, I didn't really I thought that that was really you know, quite a jump. But they were right. Uh, of course, you could do other CP violations than they were assuming. That's the one hole in their theory. So I hope you have understood with me that we now have made a major discovery on the standard model. The major discovery is that we do not know where the C generations come from. We would like to know, but we don't. I personally consider it the major problem of the present day situations, right? Are there three generations? Okay, now I want to, uh, <coughs> so late. I want to get one more chapter very quickly, it's the question of fermion masses. Fermions, that is the electron, the muon, etc., also have a mass, and the question, how can you give them a mass? Well, you can just give them a mass, m psi bar psi, that is, all of you who have had some field theory, you know that uh, you get a particle mass, by writing a term like this, in the mass of the fermion in question, that's psi bar psi. 
That's the term that when you work out the theory amounts to getting the fermion on the mass. Now, that's an end. the question is, you can only write that in this manner. Psi go up psi, you can write in this way, phi left, phi right, but phi left and phi right are defined this way with a gamma phi. That in itself is nothing special, it's just an algebraic relationship. Such, the point is that your Lagrangian must always be invariant for the symmetry transformation of the theory. If this mass term, like that, would be invariant for the symmetry transformation of the theory, you necessarily would have to have psi left and psi right to behave the same way under the symmetry, so that the product of the two, psi bar times psi bar times psi is invariant. So if, if you had a term like this and there was nothing special with it, you would break the symmetry unless the left and the right of the fermion were treated exactly the same, which means the statement that parity is conserved. It means that the left and the right of the electron and the right and the electron would do it always the same everywhere. However, if we generate, if we try to generate the mass of the fermions using the Higgs by writing an interaction like this, and then you make the shift of that field phi into something plus, you know, 1 plus f, this shift, where is it? Phi over phi plus the unit matrix times f. That also, if we have a coupling like this, generates the term psi of psi, and therefore the mass term. So I can use the Higgs system, as we make a shift, to generate the mass for the fermions. The importance of that is the following. We now have, because psi left and psi right, here, here, in order to have invariance, <coughs> They have to behave in the same way under the symmetry transformation of the theory because this, in any case, has to be a variant. If you look to this expression, psi left and psi right cannot behave the same under the symmetry because phi also has a behavior under the symmetry and it is only the combination of all three which has to be a variant. And so if these two together are already a variant, then this thing is not a variant because this one, the phi AB, does something. So if you have the transformation of the series as I described before, this can only be an invariant if psi left and psi right somehow together collaborate with phi to make an invariant. And that implies that psi left and psi right behave differently under the symmetry. And the difference of the two must be just the way that phi behaves. That's the logic. And this therefore means that if I insist that the masses of the fermions are generated by the Higgs system, then it follows necessarily that parity must be violated. So I make another major discovery. The fact that I generate the masses of the fermions by the Higgs system and not giving them directly a mass like you would do before in electrodynamics, it necessarily means you violate parity. And you know, parity is violated. So I, I, make, I make an important discovery for myself. It's not, there's not much of a proof here. I make a discovery for myself that if I want every mass to come from the Higgs system, I must violate parity, which indeed parity is violated. So I'm strengthened. I now get another idea in my head. Maybe all masses of every body is always generated by the Higgs system. So I think I'm getting here to another secret of nature. Nature does not just give particles a mass, it generates them by means of the Higgs sector. And this then gets these funny com relations to gravitation. So what's going on here? I don't know, but if they find the Higgs, we will find out. And so I'm now getting ever more curious about this Higgs system. There's only one kind of mass that's strong that the Higgs generates. That's the way nature is made. Because it turns out all fermion masses are generated this way. 
And I think that's as far as I go today. And then here is the, the investment of parity. And other hate system, and the hate system, what I will discuss tomorrow, and finish off the whole, the whole affair. If you have any questions, please go ahead and tell me. If I've gone too fast, please read these notes. You can do it on your ease. It is important, and I'm giving you information which is of a, of a remarkable type. It's different. I'm not <coughs> I'm saying here things to get a picture of what I think is going on. But part of it, it's not hard proof. You understand? I cannot prove that there's no force in there. It could be there if the masses are the same. But I see there's a pattern, and therefore I don't believe it. Yeah. And so also here is the spectrum mass. I see, I see that nature, to give mass to the particle, has chosen exclusively for the Higgs system. That should tell us something. It should give us an idea. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you here. That was so special. OK. Uh, Are there any other questions? We have totally done for it. We have already done many times. I'll give them a hard time. Okay, so then. Uh, Tomorrow I'll finish it off, I'll finish this off, and I'll start about the strongly impacting this. This may or may not be the case. He will find out. He will find out. Yeah. Thank you very much.